Thank you all. Thank you very much for um, being available for today's uh, forum. Um, happy beginning of spring. Uh, the weather is beautiful. It's a little bit on the warm side, actually. Uh, today, as usual, we have uh, several updates uh, from um, uh, our office and also uh, the other offices on campus we are uh, working with. Um, uh, and then please remember, this is your time to ask questions and uh, have in interaction here. So with that, uh, let's start with um, an update from proposal. Kelly Gilmore, Associate Director here in Sponsored Programs is going to uh, share with us updates from proposal, please. Good morning, everyone. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. So give me one moment. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna start with a couple of reminders um, and then I will go into some new information that I wanna share for you. Um, the first reminder is to please remember that all mandatory compliance items, which include PI and co-PI IPF certification, signed SIAs and Form 800s are required to be submitted prior to proposal submission to ensure compliance with federal requirements. Um, so it's always a good idea to get those together and prepared as you're preparing your IPF. Um, if they're not in by the time the IPF is submitted, please make sure you prioritize those tasks so that they can be completed and submitted before the proposal is submitted. Um, it's really important that we remember that to remain in compliance with federal requirements, that those are done before we push submit on the proposal. Um, the second item that I wanna remind everybody about is something I talked about last month, but we're continuing to see it slow down the proposal process. And that is ensuring that all PIs, co-PIs and investigators are listed on the IPF prior to routing to SPO. Um, just as a general reminder, all PIs should be listed as the lead principal investigator on the IPF. All co-PIs should be listed as principal investigators and key personnel should be listed as investigators. Um, and that should be done even if your department is not charging for their effort. Um, doing so ensures that proper approvals and certifications can be obtained during the original routing process and the IPF doesn't have to be rerouted, which in turn slows down the proposal approval process. So please make sure everybody's on those IPFs initially to begin with. Um, so let's get into some of the new topics I wanna share with you this morning. Um, the first is that the French benefit rates for the upcoming fiscal year, which is 22 through 23, have been posted, and as a result, our budget templates have been updated. Um, additionally, we have also learned that the state indirect cost rate is remaining at 30% for the upcoming year, um, and we have um, updated our budget templates to reflect that information as well. So those templates should be completely up to date um, for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, the second new item I want to share with you is that NSF program solicitations now require the use of research.gov um, for the preparation and submission of proposals. Um, please note that NSF will now start requiring the use of research.gov for uh, preparation and submission of proposals in response to program descriptions. And as a reminder, Fastlane is targeted to be removed as a submission option for all funding opportunities um, when the PEA PPG goes into effect in January of 23. Uh, Grants.gov, however, will remain a submission option for most NSF proposals, um, but it's recommended that you utilize research.gov going forward, um, effective immediately. Um, and then last but not least, NIH has clarified that no wet signatures are accepted on other support documents, only electronic signatures are going to be accepted. Um, on their frequently asked questions page, they specifically state that recipients and applicants may use the electronic software of their choice and in alignment with their institutional practices. Um, here at UC Davis, that's most often Adobe and DocuSign, um, but you'll wanna check with your IT department if you don't have those available to you. Um, a type name is not an electronic signature and is not acceptable to NIH. And um, when I'm done, I'm gonna go ahead and paste the link to those frequently asked questions in the chat box so that you have that information as well. 
And that's it for my updates. Does anybody have any questions for me? Okay, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, regarding the first item that she mentioned on her list, the mandatory compliance, uh, that's really important, especially definitely the uh, conflict of interest for when we are applying for federal um, awards. That is a requirement. We have to have it on file. Unfortunately, sometimes they are not there and we still send the proposal out and we you know, expect the, the researcher to you know, make things work really fast. We, uh, technically, we are supposed to withdraw the proposal if uh, those things are not in the file you know, timely. Also related to that are the um, uh, individual um, uh, agreements that from, you know, in some cases we have to have in um, our system before we send the proposal out. It, mostly they are uh, things like uh, royalty sharing with you know, some foundations, for example. Uh, the PIs and the members of the team, they have to say that, yes, they, are, they know that there are no, if there's intellectual property, their share of royalties would go down. That's the, their personal income that would be affected. And if they don't want it, be it no, so affected, uh, they, they cannot be a part of the team. So because of that, we have to have those documents in place. There are times that obviously, again, uh, we don't have them in time. That's fine. We you know, send the proposal out, but we you know, ask the PI that uh, you know, basically if within X number of days we don't have it, we you know, reserve the right to withdraw the proposals. This, this is because of the fact that we have been in situations that the PI somehow decided not to send, you know, work with us and give us those documents. And then suddenly the award comes in and the PI said, I don't want to sign that. And the answer to that is that, okay, then university would not accept the award. It's just that simple. I mean, there is no way around that. Um, so when we get to that discussion, it gets a little bit um, unpleasant, but um, unfortunately there is no way around that. And that's, and I, we have been there before. So we need your help. Uh, that is that. I saw a question coming in, not related to these issues. I think right before that, somebody asked a question if um, there were uh, new uh, members of um, uh, compliance COI for answering questions from researchers regarding COI. At this point, still, the, those positions are uh, in recruitment and are. Um, uh, Associate Vice Chancellor um, you know, is the one who has been taking care of all of those at this point. So um, if there are any questions, you send them to the general email address for conflict of interest and uh, uh, compliance, and uh, they would be followed up you know, the, the same day or the next day. So please use that email address. Uh, Perry, what's that email address? I don't remember it exactly or anybody who knows that, if we can put it in the chat, that's what, uh, um, that's what no, we have to do. Somebody asked what COI, it's conflict of interest. It's uh, uh, either federal or state conflict of interest forms that uh, um, have to be in place when we send the proposal out. For um, uh, working with the corporate entities, the form is 700U, that's a different, that has different basically uh, timeline. It has to be in place when they, uh, uh, we are accepting the award. But uh, conflict of interest forms for federal and state, they have to be uh, in our file when we send the proposal out. Okay, so with that, let's go to updates from awards. Uh, Grace Liu, Associate direct, uh, Director here, please. Hi, good morning, everybody. I also am going to share some slides. Um, okay. So the first thing I wanna bring to your attention is that UCOP has updated the memo on gifts versus sponsored awards. They updated this on March 10th, so it's pretty new right off the press. 
Um, I've included the link on the slide. It's that policy.ucop link, and it's on the web and everybody can access it. Uh, I think it's really useful to read through it because it's something that every department deals with and um, sometimes sponsor programs gets, in the vault, gets involved with difficult questions. But a lot of times you guys can make the determination at the department whether something's a gift or sponsored award. And here are some guidelines. Okay, so determinative indicators, meaning if these are present, it will be a sponsored award. So if the support is from a US federal government agency, it's a sponsored award. The federal government does not give gifts. If there's testing or evaluating of proprietary materials, including software on behalf of the funder, it's a sponsored award. If university IP rights are negotiated or given to the sponsor, or if the funder directs the dissemination or management of university results, including IP, it's a sponsored award. Okay, so even in the absence of these determinative indicators, um, there are some general guidelines below. And once again, I took these right out of the memo. So it's useful to go through the memo because they do give some pretty um, detailed examples, which are helpful. So general characteristics of sponsored awards is if the funded activity is directed to satisfy specific funder requirements, and there's a precise scope of work to be conducted rather than just say cancer research. Um, if the funder requires specific reporting like a technical report of research results or line item reports of expenditures. Um, once again, if the funding is from a US state or local government agency or foreign government, it's probably a sponsored award. Um, the US federal government definitely does not give sponsored awards but state and local governments usually do not either. A sponsor, um, a specific period of performance um, is usually indicative of a sponsored award. And if the funder requires unexpended funds to be returned to them at the end of the period, that's usually a sponsored award. Okay, so look through the memo, uh, refresh your, give yourself a refresher on gifts versus sponsored awards. Um, and one, two more items. One is the Simons Foundation has updated their carry forward policy effective of July, oops, sorry, July 1st of this year. Um, so unless it's otherwise stated in your award letter, the unspent funds will automatically carry forward to the next budget year to use within the approved budget categories. So, you know, one less step to go through and if the grant does specify a formal carry forward request, then the request must be um, submitted 30 days prior to the end of the funding year. Okay, so Simon's Foundation. And Kelly already went over NIH other support. Um, I'm just going to add one more thing, which is after the electronic signature, I've been told that you have to then print to PDF or save to PDF, basically flatten it and then upload that resulting um, flattened PDF. So if you just add the electronic signature and save that, sometimes it will give an error. So if you create an image off of that added electronic signature, that should remove all the errors. But um, that's all from me. And if anybody has any um, concerns or words of advice on the NIH other support, feel free to share. Okay. Let's see, I, I saw some questions coming up. Um, Okay, it's a COI question. Okay. Yeah, COI question. So yeah, just, uh, I mean, uh, that that's a good uh, comment, uh, a five minute video to, to talk about uh, PHS COI. It, yeah, that, I mean, you might wanna send that you know, uh, request as an email to the COI because that's really not my office, but uh, we can follow up on that. It, they, the topic in some ways is simple, in some other ways it's pretty complex. It's just, uh, it's simple because we have to, you know, the, follow the uh, federal rules to disclose, the PI has disclosed. It's, 
it has the potential of becoming complex because it, sometimes it's really, it, it depends on what the PI is doing. So uh, case by case, things might be different. So I, I am, I don't know, maybe a five minute video would work or not, but that's something that uh, the uh, compliance team can uh, decide. Uh, so that would be a good suggestion to send to them. Regarding the gift, um, this, uh, the, what um, Grace shared, it, this has been under um, review and work uh, basically uh, system-wide for the last two, maybe three years to uh, finally issue this uh, uh, memo that she talks about. Previous to that, we were relying on a, um, a memo from uh, 1980 from, um, uh, at that point, President Saxon of uh, uh, UC, that it is a one page memo basically. It talks about, that memo talks about gift versus grant. At that point, well, there, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion of contracts. So this new um, uh, memo or policy, it talks about sponsored award versus uh, gift. Basically, gift notes, you have to think about it from the point of view of IRS. If you are giving anything back to, uh, to the sponsor, if the sponsor in any way benefits from it, um, it, it cannot be a gift. It's just, I mean, that's one simple way of thinking about it. So, and then you know, the elements that she talked about obviously would help, but the base is, you know, IRS, IRS says that if you give somebody a gift, you should not expect anything in return. Simple. Okay, any questions about that or anything related to this? If not, we can go to presentation from um, Contracts and Grants Accounting, Mario. Thank you, Ahmad. Uh, let me share a document here. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, just uh, some quick updates from CGA. Um, wanted to inform everybody some things that we've got going on. So current initiatives, um, obviously the one that's dominating our environment right now is Aggie Enterprise. And we are uh, hard at work right now going through the different sprints to get um, information on configuration and what we can look forward to with Oracle. Um, I don't want to steal any any uh, communication on that, just to say that um, it definitely impacts the production and um, the bandwidth of CGA. So along those lines, um, we do have some staffing updates. We, we're currently recruiting uh, two RA4 positions and an RA3 position with the intent of creating some bandwidth um, as we go into the next really 15 months to prepare for um, the Aggie Enterprise Initiative. Uh, we also have some others that are being backfilled, but um, these positions are currently out on, on um, the system. Along those lines as well, we wanted to talk about our communication. So we have the current EFA at EC Davis EDU email address where in our awards and amendments, CPA training awards and amendments and high-risk transfers are going. Uh, we're getting a lot of other emails coming through. So what we've done is we've created the AskCGA at ecdavis.edu and uh, communication will be going out with these email addresses. So you don't need to jot them down, but uh, so the Ask CGA, if you think of Ask Jeeves, for those who remember that, uh, it's really if you have a question but you're not sure what group or what what uh, person within CGA to ask that question to, um, use that email address. It'll help us better um, assign the questions and manage the incoming uh, volume of emails. And thirdly, we have uh, on the cash team side of the shop, we have a, a CGA cash team email address. This one is unique in that it is now linked to a ServiceNow ticketing system. So the main consumer right now really outside of CGA is the cashier's office. 
um, a lot of their communications requesting payment allocation or payment application is, is being used for this. It's a pilot program we're using within CGA to determine the efficiency of a ticketing system and what larger application we can we can look at for uh, CGA. So if you have any questions that are payment related or you're looking for how a payment was applied, you can go ahead and uh, use the cash team, the CGA cash team at ecdavis.edu. Uh, again, knowing that that will generate a ServiceNow ticket. Any questions on that before I move forward? I don't, I've got my screen so I can't see that. See. Okay, so also an update I wanted to give on um, portal submissions of invoices, uh, specifically as EasyFed grant. Uh, before that, though, just the, the trend prior to the pandemic was that a lot of sponsors are going to a portal to submit invoicing. Some of those portals are also being used to submit reporting, so financial or performance reports. Uh, we saw an increase during the pandemic and in, in sponsors using some type of automated invoice submission platform to avoid the submission of a of a invoice manually or payments via non-payment systems um, such as bill.com or other payment applications. So one of the trends we're seeing now is uh, something with Easy Fed Grant, which is we're submitting invoices through the portal, but it's also the same portal where we're, um, performance reports and financial reports are submitted. So with all that information there, the creates the opportunity for them to cross-reference data. One of the things that is coming up with Easy Fed Grants is that we are um, being blocked from being able to submit an invoice if there is a delinquent um, performance report or financial report due. In the past, we would get a notification that um, a report was due, but it was not a hard stop that prevented us from being able to invoice. So this is, this is new. And we're also along with that is the notifications that are going out to the different parties involved in an award. So Easy Fed Grants is sending out a notification of a due performance report to the PIs. We are getting one um, at CGA. Um, so we don't want to we don't want to throw another um, layer of communication where those notifications are still going out. What we do want to do though is if we get a uh, invoice that is not being able to be submitted because of a delinquent report, we are going to just FYI the department, um, the account manager and the PI just to let them know that uh, invoicing is being blocked until the performance report has been submitted. Um, we know that right now most departments, uh, account managers and PIs are getting these notifications. So we just don't want to make an assumption that one was received and then notification go out. So bear with us as we go through this process. You may receive uh, redundant information, but better to have some redundant information than to miss a notification that impacts invoicing. So let me check Any questions. Don't see anything in the chat. So lastly, uh, one of the things that we do is work closely in CGA with uh, the Audit Management and Advisory Services, AMAS. Um, AMAS helps to coordinate external audits. Uh, we work closely with them. They're a great support to uh, CGA. So in working with them recently, we wanted to bring their group to this uh, platform to have um, them be able to speak to their process, their team, what they do, and how they can support the campus research community. So I want to introduce uh, Pam Ranslow, who is a senior, um, I'm going to butcher her title, but I think she's a senior audit um, analyst. Correct me, Pam, if I get your title wrong, I'm sure I did. But 
Pam um, wants to give a, a brief presentation on kind of what they do. So Pam, I think you were having technical difficulties before, but I hope yeah. you can log in now. I'm going to stop sharing. And if it's okay, kick it over to you, Pam. Hi. Thank you, Mario. I also have a couple of um, slides. Can anybody see that? Yeah, great. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Pamela Ranslow. I am my title is senior editor and also external audit coordinator here on campus. Um, and I'm just here to do a quick introduction of our team and our role. Um, our team is part of the audit and management advisory service department, also known as internal audit. And we have been coordinating external audits since 2010. Although from 2010 to 2020, we had only one coordinator and she retired, she was great. Uh, so since then, we have created a team in our department and we update our process a little bit. We have created this email that is bright orange right here. Um, and that helps us track all the requests and as well as track the audits. So we really thought this would be a great platform to share this information and share a little bit about our role. Um, so for those of who don't know or have been lucky enough not to be in an external audit, uh, there's audits that we, uh, we coordinate. These are audits that are uh, done by external parties, so our sponsors or a government entity that may come in and request to do either a desk review, a compliance review, an annual review if, it's, uh, if we're subrecipients or a financial audit. Um, so within our role, we are the central point of contact between the auditor and the university, and which has been really helpful to maintain consistency when we respond um, and develop a process to address requests and inquiries in a timely manner. As, as we have built great relationships with auditors in the past and everybody in the university that can help us complete these. Um, so I won't really go over every step of the process of external audit, but mainly I want to let you guys know that we're here. If you ever get an audit notification or something that may look like it, um, we, will the, we will be the ones that you can reach out to and we can assist you and figure it out what it is that they need and try to coordinate that with them. Unfortunately, not all the notifications come to us. Uh, in fact, a lot of them may come to you, the, the CAM managers or the PI. Uh, some of them go to the Office of Research, some go to Finance, and we have been slowly getting the word out that you can send those to us, uh, to this email that is listed here. And the process is typically from there, somebody in our team will be assigned to it, and we'll determine how to go from there and we'll help you go from like the planning process of that audit to the reporting or corrective actions all the way through. Um, our team is made of me and Miriam. I don't know if you can pop in and say hi so everybody can see you. Good morning, this is Miriam. Hey, hi Miriam and um, Hannah. Hey everyone, my name's Hannah. Yay. So this is our team. Uh, Miriam and I have been doing this for the past two years. Hannah recently joined our team as well. Um, and if you do want to learn more about the process, we do have a webinar coming up April 26, How to Survive an Audit. It is part of the Research Administrator Certificate Series. So you might have taken it already. Um, and if not, this is a good refresher to figure out what's new. Um, this is done virtually, it's about hour and a half on April 26. We will talk about not only our role, we'll talk about the internal audit process as well. We talk about common requests that we receive from auditors and resources that you can use to prepare for an audit. Um, you can also go to our website, audit.ucdavis.edu and we have a section there that that's a great description of the whole process uh, that you know you can read too. But yeah, that that's all for me. 
if there's any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much, Pam. Um, I, I want to say things a little bit stronger than what Pam said. It, um, from my point of view, internal audit is a, both internal and external, huge service that we all have to depend on. Uh, on the side of internal audit, I tell my people and I tell my colleagues in, uh, in the audit that I would prefer them to be here in my office before external audit shows up. Uh, because again, they would see things that we might not see. Uh, there are times that I, I call my colleagues in um, internal audit and ask for help. And I know they have schedules that based on schedules, they do certain audits, but um, in sort of ad hoc, um, I depend on them a lot. So that's the, I mean, that's the importance of internal audit. For external audit, I wanna make sure that I would say things a little bit stronger than what Pam said. It's not only that they are a service to help departments, it has, it's the only place that we have to be. It's just um, outside entities send you know, notices of audit to departments and all of that. The first thing that anybody should do who receives those notices is not to answer the email, but forward the email to the external audit. That's really the first thing we all have to do. Uh, any communication that goes from there, it really should be from external audit and not from the department or individuals who received it. So I hope that helps. It just, I didn't see Pam saying it as strongly. I think that as a, as a customer and user of the service, I you know I wanted to make sure that um, I would say it the way I said it because that's, that's really what it has to be. Outside entities send a notes of audit, let's say from whatever, whoever, NIH, NSF, or whoever, to PI or the department that they have the information about. The minute you receive it, you, you should you know, really forward that email to our colleagues in the audit. Yeah, thank you so much for clarifying that for everybody. Yes, we within our role, we, we not only coordinate them, but we track them and then we report them to the audit committee as well. So it's important that, that we do receive all of them, even though we may not even coordinate them. If it's a programmatic audit that is directly done with the PI, we will still be tracking and making sure that it's complete all the way through and that we all feel better about it uh, when it's closed. Sometimes it takes so long to get to, get to that point. So thank you so much. Um, Pam, I just, wanted, I just wanted to add that, um, just to um, add to what Ahmad was saying, that yes, if you receive an email from the sponsor and it's a question and you, you, you kind of know the answer so you feel like you can answer it, even if you're not sure, if it has the word like review in there or something, even if it doesn't specifically say audit, go ahead and forward it to us and ask us and we'll sift through it and we'll decide, you know, whether this is something that's our responsibility or not. But it's always safer to ask us because it might be, it might start off as one question and you know the answer and then it might snowball into a lot of follow-up. And before we get into the middle of that follow-up, we'd like to have that on our radar already. Sometimes we kind of, if, if it doesn't go through our proper channel, it comes to us when it's in the middle of basically a full-blown audit at that point. And yes, site visits as well. We do coordinate the site visits, Yoki. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for our colleagues or any other questions regarding anything that we, any of us might be able to answer? I see John is here from IRB. Any questions for IRB or any comments from IRB or anything else? We have no announcements, but we will not tolerate any questions either. That's good. <laughs> okay. I, Wait, I have one more announcement. CGA reminded me when they um, advertised their openings. We have a team lead opening um, here in SPO on the awards side. Uh, Melanie Brown will be retiring in June. So um, if anybody is interested in joining the SPO awards team, please look at that job posting. Good. Yeah, Melanie has been um, a, a member of Davis, uh, UC Davis community uh, in several different positions, including uh, contracting services and more recently in our office. So uh, that's the position 
that uh, we have we would have opened starting from beginning of July. Um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. I had something I wanted to mention. Um, I had uh, some communication with Alyssa Bunn last week, and she made me aware that uh, composite benefit rates had been recently revised and the projections going forward updated. And so it, I, I hadn't realized that. So I just wanted to mention it um, in case there was anyone else that uh, didn't know about it. And um, the template, the, the template, the budget template, the OR template A budget template has been updated to reflect that. So thank you, Alyssa Bunn, for, for doing that so promptly. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? If not, we are going to, I guess, have another short meeting. Doesn't seem like anything is coming in. Okay, 30 more seconds. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody. Um, we will meet you, I guess we'll see you next month. Meanwhile, uh, we will be going back to providing services to the ones who we serve. Have a great rest of the day.